um, has uh, Nubian pyramids uh, on the on the album cover. So everybody go uh, go check that out. I always show that to to my uh, to my students when we're making the point that uh, pyramids do not end at the border uh, between Egypt and the Sudan by any means. Um, thank you all for uh, joining us to hear from our distinguished speaker, Amel Fadlola, uh, who is a uh, professor of anthropology at the University of, uh, of Michigan, Ann Arbor, a place very near and dear uh, to my heart where I spent many years, um, and not just a professor of anthropology, I should say, professor of women and gender studies, Afro-American and African studies. Uh, in that department, she is currently the associate chair. Professor Fadlallah uh, researches and teaches such topics as humanitarianism, gender, reproductive health, health more generally, and migration. She is an internationally recognized expert on Sudan and its diaspora, uh, as well as uh, issues related to the African continent, uh, generally speaking. She holds a number of academic uh, degrees from the University of Khartoum, as well as a, a doctorate from Northwestern University here in the United States. As will not surprise just about anyone in our audience, and thank you all uh, for coming, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you in a figurative way through, uh, through the magic of Zoom. Uh, Professor Fadlola exhibits a deep sense of professional, personal, and political commitment. Now, in my field in uh, Arabic language and literature, uh, writers love, love to talk about iltizam, could talk about it uh, all day. We'll leave it at, uh, at commitment here. Uh, her anthropological work is full of commitment to the present day, uh, to the public sphere, and to politics. She regularly publishes uh, in the, the press, in the general press, beyond academic publishing. Uh, current subjects of much debate, speculation, and indeed public misunderstanding, such as veiling the predicament of the, quote, lost boys of South Sudan, all come to the fore in her formal academic writing, as well as her contributions to mass media outlets like Al Jazeera, just to name one, uh, where she publishes outside of the confines of, uh, of academia. Uh, currently, I can tell you personally, uh, from my teaching experience, uh, my international studies course right now, Introduction to the Middle East, uh, features her book, uh, Branding Humanity, uh, on the lost boys in the world, NGOism, or should we say NGOization, uh, humanitarian public sphere. And I can think of few authors in any field who write about these issues with the kind of rigor and personal intimacy that Professor Fadlallah has. Um, I should say that in addition to the African at noon, Africa at Noon uh, uh, series, which, um, which of course is graciously hosting us uh, here, this is also part of the Department of African Cultural Studies uh, series, Embodied Africa, it is a professional and personal pleasure for me to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Amal Fadlallah. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, generous um, introduction. And it's really an honor to be, um, to be with you virtually. I mean, I heard a lot about this place, of course. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's an honor to, to be with you today. So, um, my talk today, I want to give you um, a tour <laughs> um, of my own engagement with this uh, question of, uh, of the body and embodiment. Um, so um, I'll start uh, by saying that um, uh, I want to uh, emphasize how the turn and return to the study of the body and embodiment um, in African context uh, is closely connected to anthropologist attempt to deconstruct anthropologist colonial, colonial binaries and uh, also anthropologist methods of understanding the West and the rest of the world, especially you know, uh, in the 80s and 90s. Theories um, that center the concept of time, uh, the concept of the body, the spaces we inhabit and how we relate to each other especially in kinship studies, open the door for, uh, for us to learn about multiple modernities and for uh, interrogating the ways we write about other cultures and other places. 
For instance, and in the 80s, we witnessed a heated debate about kinship and blood relatedness, uh, which many anthropologists began to situate in embodied performances, often in their attempts to critique um, emphasis on, on using Africa as a site for discovering Europe. Uh, and such debates, uh, which began in, um, in the 80s and flourished in the 90s, turned the gaze to Europe um, uh, itself as a site for studying various embodied practices, especially, you know, uh, practices related to kinship, to family, and to belonging. So during this time, you know, we see also that, you know, second wave feminism uh, inspiring many feminist anthropologists from different locations and, um, you know, uh, gave, gave them uh, great platforms to speak from uh, and to voice their critiques and responses um, to these uh, debates. Um, so from the 80s onward, um, feminist anthropologists uh, found fertile grounds to plant uh, you know, new ideas about the body, about embodiment. Um, and as I said, you know, uh, they deconstructed all the ideas about science and perceptions of health and uh, well-being globally. Um, writing in the 80s, you know, most feminist anthropologists experimented with new ideas, but, you know, could not entirely escape the inherited tensions embedded in the binaries uh, or the binary distinction of here and there. Uh, such binaries uh, plague the discipline for a long time, but these de tensions and debates uh, also produced uh, rich ethnographies uh, that urged us to decolonize our methods, um, uh, decolonize uh, uh, our perceptions uh, of Africa so that we can embed our understanding of embodied practices in histories um, of both old um, and emerging empires. That, of course, we cannot understand embodied performances, especially in Africa, without situating uh, these practices in global economic disparities and without reflecting uh, on the place of Africa in the global political state. Also, and, and most importantly, uh, these uh, early debates and attention uh, to methods underline that what is thought of as different there in Africa, in the Middle East and elsewhere is not so much different from what we confront right here in, in Western setting. So uh, before I start, let me share my, um, my slides um, and I'll continue. Is it? Yes, we can see it. <laughs> Great. So let me um, uh, do that. Yeah, here we go. Sorry about that. All right. So uh, all of uh, all this introduction that I just gave is to say that. I am a beneficiary of this heated anthropological debate that took place in the 80s and 90s. Uh, because as a student of anthropology at the University of Khartoum in Sudan, at the end of the 80s, uh, when I finished my undergraduate studies and also began my honor and master's studies um, in the 90s, these debates were certainly present um, in, in my classroom. And the reason I think you know, the 90s was an interesting decade is because that time allowed for this kind of debate and, and this kind of conversation, especially how to do engaged uh, ethnography and how to decolonize uh, our discipline. So you know, to this time in the 80s and 90s, I attribute the turn and return to the body and to embodiment. And from that time onward, as I said, we gained rich ethnographic work saturated with um, anthropological pessimism, uh, but also a lot of optimism, encouraging us to write with 
and to engage our interlocutors uh, to bring issues of marginalities, um, issues of marginality, of racism, and also of exclusionary tactics of citizenship to the fore. Uh, so this background was very important for me personally when I, uh, I was writing or thinking about uh, embodying honor. Um, and um, uh, which came in um, in 2007. And I actually, I have to say, it came out from uh, Wisconsin University Press. So here we go, full circle, <laughs> time to celebrate. So in, in embodying honor, um, I wrote with a, a very key, uh, a keen eye on uh, how to deconstruct the binaries of here and there by grounding embodiment in the political history of Sudan and the region that I studied in Eastern Sudan. So I worked in, in a very small town in Eastern Sudan called Sinkat Town. Um, but I was also thinking about, you know, national and global issues um, um, in a colonial and post-colonial uh, colonial settings. Uh, especially, you know, how uh, migrant women um, to that town continued to embody um, you know, uh, the ritual practices of fertility and infertility. And you know, thinking about the various stories that they told me about their health, their sickness, and about um, their well-being. Um, so I found that you know, their understanding of their own bodies and, and, and uh, their understanding of the sentiment of kinship is closely connected to how they understood the world around them, including how they, um, you know, they uh, understood colonial and post-colonial policies that treated them as marginal citizens and continued to impact their own um, health and also the health of the, of the whole community. So through the stories that you know, many women told me about their vulnerable bodies, I began to understand what I called in the book, that feminization of vulnerability a term that I used to examine women's place in, in the community and to also examine their interpretation of their own personal histories and the history of the world um, they described to me. So I was actually interested in how they interpreted the sentiment of living together and how you know, this sentiment has been transformed by the increasing commodification of their world and how they, you know, incorporated and or resisted such transformation through the logic of halafa, uh, which, you know, means how to reverse, to make amends. And halafa is from the Arabic word khalaf, to reverse, reminds me of the social distance measures that we lived um, during COVID. Um, so, uh, and it, you know, it's used to kind of um, reverse uh, harm. So, so the feminization of vulnerability that I talked about in the book was an important concept that came from their own stories and that also helped me to analyze and understand these stories uh, and to understand their practices and to put them in, in, in context. Um, so, uh, the, this context was very important. Um, so to, to kind of think about why Hadandawa, you know, um, you know, think about the world uh, uh, beyond their border as very uh, dangerous um, uh, because they live in this desert-like territory uh, tucked between the Nile and the Red Sea. Uh, so, so they are nomads, right? Uh, they inhabited this region for for centuries and they have resisted the influence of successive colonial powers. They fought against Arab penetration into their region and later fought hard against the Turco-Egyptian rule. Uh, and also they fought against the Anglo-Egyptian policies, especially um, uh, against policies of urbanization, mining and resettlements, which continued after the independence of the Sudan. Um, 
So, you know, because of that, you know, there, uh, no wonder the ritual practices center the sentiment of vulnerability, especially, you know, the vulnerability of the female body and its reproductive potential, which is very essential to the sentiment of living together in a larger community. And of course, there is no wonder, of course, you know, uh, that they deal with and negotiate, you know, other practices by filtering them carefully through their own lens of halafa, of this reversal logic, uh, to restore their own health, but also to restore the well-being of the whole community. So in many ways, you know, uh, Embodying Honor uh, was the first book that allowed me to think about this feminization of vulnerability. It's embodied practices um, and, and uh, also to think about, uh, you know, how to read uh, these practices against both national and transnational politics. So this this uh, theme of feminization later inspired me to think about Sudan itself as a country in Africa, a country that is often, you know, feminized uh, and often represented as vulnerable in, in world politics and in um, academic um, writings. Uh, Sudan, as, as many of you know, is a diverse country, uh, has a complex history of um, struggling with its own placement in the global map, uh, especially, you know, with this question of identity and who are the Sudanese? Are they Arabs? Are they Africans? Are they both? Are they something else? So this question of identity has been at the center of intellectual debate about citizenship and belonging in the Sudan and also abroad, it has been a question uh, among Sudanese in the diaspora as well, since the country's independence uh, from the British uh, in, um, in 1956. Uh, and this is just, you know, a slide to kind of uh, show you, you know, some important um, dates in, um, in the history of Sudan, and I will refer to some of these dates uh, in, in my talk, in the remainder of this talk. So as a young nation, and I think 67 years is still young. <laughs> so, um, you know, so as a young nation, uh, this state um, of betweenness, this state of hybridity, I contributed uh, to the perception of Sudan as a vulnerable nation state, especially when, you know, the Islamist um, uh, government took power in the, at the end of the 80s. And I can say that, you know, the representation of Sudan shifted uh, after that time, after the Islamists took power, uh, because I remember, you know, just from my father telling me, and then uh, from the time that I lived after that, uh, in the 60s and 70s, there was a better imagination of Sudan that perceived this country differently. Sudan was once imagined as a nation that bridges between Africa, Middle East, and beyond, uh, uh, an Africa Middle East corridor if you will. It was also dubbed the heart of Africa because of its geographic location and it's dubbed the food basket of the world. But with the change of global politics at the end of the Cold War uh, and you know the Islamists taking power in different Eastern countries, this representation began to, to change. Uh, so after embodying honor, I began to focus on how Sudan, you know, itself, this big nation in Africa, uh, is represented outside Sudan, and how global politics still reflects, you know, interventionist agendas and, and competing claims about sovereignty, about modernity, and the right to become a national citizen, and a citizen of, of the world, uh, generally speaking. Uh, so within uh, this context, I also examined, examined how gender embodiment and vulnerability play an important role in the intense debate and contestation over Sudan's identity uh, and its place in the world. You know, and we know that this contestation and this debate um, uh, has ultimately led to the split of the Sudan into two nation states. Uh, in, uh, in 2011. So now we have two nation state, we have Sudan and we have the Republic of South Sudan, right? So, so all these questions 
brought me very close to my second major project, which materialized in my second book, um, uh, Branding Humanity, uh, Competing Narratives um, of Violence, Rights, and Global Citizenship, which um, unlike embodying honor, I, I started thinking about it uh, and writing it uh, from here, uh, from, from the United States. Um, So in, in the remainder of this talk, I will give some examples from this book uh, and the major questions that I raised uh, in it. So you can follow some of the arguments and, and links that I already, um, I already um, made. So as I said, um, branding humanity um, is an attempt from my, uh, my part uh, to flip the script, uh, to read Sudan uh, from America. Uh, from Washington DC specifically, uh, because during the time I was doing field work, there were about 20,000 Sudanese living there. Um, so I interviewed uh, Sudanese from all ethnicities uh, for this project and also interviewed people uh, who are interested in Sudan. I call them in the book, I call them Sudanese allies. But the main focus was on Sudanese who are uh, who were doing activism for Sudan and also have connection with, uh, with uh, NGOs, um, American NGOs in particular. So, so the moment of doing that research was a very important moment, a very uh, important historical moment. I should say a very tense uh, historical moment, uh, especially because uh, you know, Northern Sudanese and Southern Sudanese politicians who have been in war since the country's independence signed a peace deal in 2005 with the aid of the international community, including the United States. The deal ended the war uh, between the North and the South and Southern Sudanese shared the power with the Islamists in Khartoum in the hope that both uh, parties will, uh, will uh, work together to uh, keep the unity of the country. But of course, we know that didn't happen and the country um, uh, split into two after uh, the end of that peace deal. Also during that time, uh, you know, um, uh, Darfur uh, was a big deal. Um, Darfur conflict uh, broke in 2003 and it grabbed the international attention and American media attention and the attention of NGOs and uh, politicians um, uh, in the United States uh, championed the cause of Darfurians and campaigned in various political and media venues to raise awareness about this conflict. That is why it was very important for me to show that Sudan itself has been an important site for you know, this debate about sovereignty, about citizenship rights, about nationality um, and transnational citizenship. So, uh, so the most important question that uh, the book um, raises is how, you know, this debate uh, continues to mobilize existing social divisions of gender, of ethnicity, of race, and also of nationality to produce, you know, new gendered and new uh, racialized categories uh, outside Sudan. So in the book, I talk about how Sudan, like many nations in Africa, is struggling, uh, not just in Africa, <laughs> many, na many nations in the world, actually, how it is, is struggling to build an inclusive nation state and to promote you know, this idea of diversity as a backbone for this inclusiveness. Uh, and because of this lack of inclusiveness, you know, the question of the identity of Sudan itself has been, as I said, a lingering question uh, for politicians, for elites, for the artists that I interviewed, uh, you know, uh, and it has been a lingering question for Sudanese in the Sudan and also for uh, Sudanese outside Sudan and for people, for their allies as well. So unfortunately, instead of 
you know, mobilizing, you know, the diversity of Sudan to envision national unity and to envision an inclusive citizenship project. Most of the transnational activists and celebrities who campaigned for Sudan reproduced similar divisive and binary rhetoric, especially, you know, during the North-South War and even at the brink of Sudan separation and also during the Darfur conflict. And as I said, you know, this, you know, this um, binary rhetoric, it was a major uh, feature of all the campaigns that took place inside and outside Sudan. So um, I give many examples in the book to explain how, you know, the mobilization of ethnicity, of gender, and uh, of identity politics enabled transnational solidarities and alliances with, with Sudanese politicians, with Sudanese leaders, and also with activists uh, before, you know, the recent uh, revolution uh, that is, you know, that doubled Omar al-Bashir um, in 2019. So these solidarities, which were often created along um, gendered, religious, and ethnic lines, were meant then were meant to contest the Islamist regime of Omar al-Bashir and to offer new solutions uh, during you know, a tense historical time between you know, the West and the Muslim world, especially you know, after 9-11 attacks and uh, you know, the whole discourse and rhetoric about war on terror. But uh, you know, I don't think these solidarities, these early solidarities succeeded in toppling the regime. Uh, I think these transnational solidarities escalated situations of war, escalated situation of conflict in the country, and gave more legitimacy to Omar al-Bashir uh, and extended its life. Uh, so with reference to this, I give the example of how, you know, transnational actors and humanitarian activists, how they use the simplistic understanding of Sudanese issues and how they framed their, their narratives around, you know, the binaries of the Arab Muslim, Muslim Sudanese figure, or often read as white or as bad Arab Muslim, who is waging war against the passive black Christians of South Sudan. And of course, you know, South Sudanese were not passive, they were fighting, right? Same symbolistic narrative was later applied to the Darfur conflict and the media and various activist groups in the US, including famous uh, celebrities, you know, Colony comes to mind here, used similar simplistic representation, um, such as, you know, the Arab uh, Muslim figure from the North is again waging war Again, is the passive black Muslim of Darfur. And we know that Darfurian have also been uh, fighting. They're not, um, they're not passive um, victims in that, in that way, in that um, representation. Um, so obviously, you know, these embodied binaries and representation of Sudanese identities are overly simplistic, but they circulated easily and frequently in the media and in academic circles. So, you know, the complex issues of diversity were glossed over and, you know, intricate situations of war, of conflict and displacement were attributed to, you know, this inherent uh, gender uh, and ethnic and religious divisions, um, you know, and um, of course, you know, this, this uh, representation, you know, were meant to help policymakers act and intervene. And of course, you know, here is a, a you know, an, a, a slide where it shows that, uh, you know, Col Colony is, um, in, you know, um, briefing um, Obama um, on Sudanese issues in 2010. So in branding humanity, what I wanted to do is to work again is these embodied simplistic narratives of uh, gender, of uh, religious and ethnic identities as a strategy for pushing back against the risk of mobilizing identity politics in this way. I show how you know, this um, binary rhetoric uh, created more exclusion, created more fragmentation based on gender, on race and, uh, and ethnicity. In addition, I also wanted to show that you know, the transnational discourse 
of human rights and humanitarianism that informed national and transnational solidarities and, uh, and alliances for Sudan ignored the varied landscape of activism in the country and in the diaspora. And this varied landscape of activism became more visible during the recent waves of revolt in the Sudan, which succeeded in toppling uh, Omar al-Bashir in 2019, but it's, it's still going. You know, uh, Omar al-Bashir has been in power for 30 years. His regime is really entrenched. So there's, you know, these activist protests are still in the streets fighting. So in, in, in the chapters uh, you, you've read for this book, uh, you also see how, you know, stories about Sudan uh, were represented in, in, in the new public spheres created by different uh, activists and different uh, NGOs. Um, um, I coin, you know, the term uh, humanitarian publics uh, to refer to these new spaces and, and to show how, you know, the figure of the suffering Sudanese, mostly child and woman, emerged within these public spheres uh, to embody and to represent, you know, the vulnerability of the Sudanese nation, itself, uh, nation state itself, to represent the uh, vulnerability of the Sudanese nation state itself. These suffering Sudanese, whether they are lost boys and girls of Sudan, or they are, uh, you know, sexually um, uh, assaulted women, are represented as victims uh, at the beginning of their recruitment. Uh, but then they get, uh, you know, incorporated in these public spheres, and they are educated uh, in this in these uh, spaces to overcome their suffering and to become role models and human rights and humanitarian activists who can eventually help both Sudan and South Sudan to achieve the status of modernity and progress from uh, their um, location uh, in the West. So these victims turned human rights actors and activists must embody their suffering stories and tell their suffering stories in a familiar way to a Western global audience in order to be listened to. Uh, often this uh, storytelling is done through the mass production of sensational knowledge about Sudan, uh, which you know, uh, produced a new genre of writing known as translated suffering in, in the human rights and humanitarian uh, arenas. So in this uh, style of narration, especially in the, you know, the film documentaries and in the book you see in this slide, uh, we see Sudanese ethnic identities taken away from their intricate social uh, political context and reproduced in new guises outside Sudan in order to, to fit a familiar racial category of white versus black. So the production and circulation of these narratives and stories of violence, for me, they worked as effective techniques to point blame at the acts of the Islamist regime and to highlight its inhumane practices against its minority citizens. So unlike you know, the infantilized stories of the lost boys and girls of the Sudan that communicated you know, Southern suffering, to global audiences, we see how you know, the stories of the quote unquote oppressed Sudanese woman often uh, present an orientalized and feminized narrative of vulnerability and suffering that depicted Sudan as an ailing nation state, an ailing nation state, especially at the verge of the country's partition. And um, in the book, I show, you know, I, I um, I show, um, you know, the, uh, or I, I retell, the, you know, the stories of so many of, of the people that I uh, interviewed uh, in this book. Uh, some of them um, also in this um, in this chapter that uh, some of you uh, maybe um, looked at. 
uh, you know, there are different, different stories, such as the story of Halima Bashir was a very famous story. Um, uh, Halima, you know, was, you know, um, sexual violence, um, you know, um, uh, represented as sexual violence victim. Um, uh, during the height of uh, campaigning for Darfur, she met President George Bush and presented uh, him with, um, you know, with her book. And, you know, it became a, a very important issue for, for George Bush then um, during his second term. Uh, at the end of his first term, um, beginning of his second term. Uh, then there is a story of Lubna al Hussein, also a very famous uh, story. And she ran into trouble with the security in Sudan, but they didn't know that she's a big journalist. And then the moment the French heard about her story, they invited her to come and live in Paris. Um, so this is um, uh, Bernard Kochner here, um, greeting her. Uh, and then um, uh, this is uh, also uh, Hawa Muhammad Saleh, uh, who is a very famous Darfurian um, activist. Um, receiving the Women of Courage Award, um, also, you know, represented as, you know, uh, a human rights, a humanitarian activist uh, by um, Michelle and um, uh, Hillary Clinton here. Um, I'm looking at the time, that's all. <laughs> uh, but I'm almost done. Uh, and then, of course, um, uh, Lal, uh, Jal, Emmanuel Jal, uh, lost boy, child soldier, um, a famous artist performer who is also, you know, um, represented as, you know, a human rights activist, humanitarian, uh, a humanitarian activist, and a global citizen. Um, uh, he's a great uh, performer. Uh, but, you know, he has, he always kind of tell his story of suffering um, before uh, beginning his performances. Now, I think it's changed a little bit and I'm looking into that. Um, and of course, you know, the story of Alec Weck, uh, supermodel Alec Weck uh, also, and the way she uh, talks about her suffering. Now she's ambassador with many, um, you know, um, uh, humanitarian organization working and distributing, um, you know, aid uh, to Southern Sudanese um, um, and on other places as well. Um, and then I think her story inspired the Miss South uh, Sudan uh, in America uh, contest, um, also something that I raised in, in, in the book. And um, uh, I think, um, you know, all these stories, as I said, uh, I mean, kind of reflect how this, you know, humanitarian public uh, grew uh, and how it became a place to kind of socialize uh, these different um, actors and activists. So uh, to end uh, this talk, I would like to just say that I am now working on, um, uh, you know, this concept of diaspora public that, uh, or diaspora publics that I um, introduced in the book. Uh, it's a counter public that uh, comment on what is happening in this um, humanitarian publics. Uh, but, you know, this, this uh, diaspora public um, becomes um, uh, very visible during the recent Sudanese revolts in 2018 and 2019. So I am working on how these diaspora publics have become very visible uh, during these revolts and how they shape the various sites of protest built by protesters also in Sudan. So these kind of uh, new solidarities. Um, so to conclude, um, you know, I would say, or I should end by saying that while many actors uh, in various humanitarian publics privilege the transnational framework of rights and ethnic belonging as a model to influence policy making in, in you know, previous uh, solidarities, um, especially during, you know, activism for South Sudan and for Darfur. Now, you know, these actors in Sudan and in various diaspora publics use the language of nationalism and inclusive citizenship rights to assert their belonging at the national and uh, transnational level. 
Uh, so this is also an image, it might be familiar to you. It's Ala Salah who appeared in the New York Times under this title. It's going to be the image of the revolution. So I'm working on it with reference to, you know, the stories of the, all the women that I talked about and the representation of Sudan itself in, in the, this global stage and thinking about her and Nubia. Samuel. <laughs> so uh, I can talk a little bit about that if you like. Uh, but you know, it might be the image of my next book, who knows, right? So um, uh, I will just end here. And thank you again for this uh, great invitation. Many thanks, uh, Professor Fadlodla, for the talk. I, I should tell you, by the way, by way of, uh, of reassurance, that um, we were, we're doing great on time. Uh, <laughs> we generally were a little conservative about saying, well, stick to, to 40 minutes because almost everybody goes over. Um, but we are, uh, we, are, we are doing great. Thank you very much uh, for the talk, for sort of uh, walking us through now multiple book projects of yours. Um, and the evolution of, uh, of, of images of uh, Sudanese, particularly uh, Sudanese abroad, or, or, or how um, distinct groups of Sudanese people uh, tend to, to be represented uh, in mass media and in the, the context of, uh, of international politics in the NGO uh, work. We are open to uh, your questions. Make sure I've got our various... Um, our various windows open so I can I can keep track of them. We have a Q and A function. We also have a, a chat box, and I'm going to uh, monitor them both. So please do uh, to you in the audience. Uh, please do weigh in. That certainly includes uh, my students. Some, several of whom I've seen uh, have attended here with my with my thanks. There are questions for Professor Fadlalo. Did you all hear me very well during the talk? Fantastic. Good to know. Well, how about this? I'll try to break the ice. I, I'm not seeing them pop up, but please do, um, you know, just meditate a little bit on 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 the questions or comments that you might offer to our speaker. Um, an icebreaker I might uh, I might offer here has to do with uh, with the kind of you know standard uh, gender categories of um, uh, of a place that's been colonized or a place that that has been invaded and 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 occupied. And as you say, the the sort of default is uh, to feminize uh, Sudan both uh, historically and in in specific contexts of uh, of its citizens, of its subjects. Um, but thinking of uh, Arabic cases, uh, you know, Arabic, uh, 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 a language and in, uh, in a, in a literary language in particular that uh, in which Egypt has kind of had an outsized uh, role in, in shaping, um, there are quite a few uh, very starkly uh, masculinist representations of, uh, of, of Sudanese peoples here. I'm, I'm thinking of the, uh, the journal Hiwar in uh, in Lebanon uh, that published uh, Toyeb Saleh's uh, early work on on um, on sort of uh, post-colonial uh, revenge and, and and revenge fantasies on the on the part of uh, of mostly men. Uh, also, um, Hisham Bedreddin, the, uh, the the karate expert, uh, became sort of a cause to live. I guess a little bit in English, and uh, especially in Canada, but. Um, but but certainly in 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 Arabic, you know, he's be he became maybe 10, 20 years ago a bit of a celebrity for being tough for uh, having attacked uh, a, a, a cleric and and uh, for having been this kind of uh, martial artist. So I, I wonder, from your perspective in anthropology, um, uh, are there sort of uh, multiple strains of, of of gender discourse when it comes to treating Sudan from outside or tr treating uh, Sudanese uh, peoples as uh, as as foreigners, whether it's 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 from a post-colonial uh, perspective in in Europe, the United States, et cetera, or uh, in Arabic or or in other traditions? Yeah, well, thank you so much for this question. Um, I, you know, when I look at this representation, I always look at the context as well. And I feel that the context um, kind of shift 
you know, uh, shift the discourse and shift the the uh, the way you know Sudanese are represented. So you know, when I um, talk about you know this example that I um, I talk about in the book. Uh, definitely, there was a, a, a historical context that allowed uh, for this representation. You know, this whole thing about you know the Islamist and um, also about you know Sudan breaking, and it's a, a discourse of um, vulnerability that you know it, it doesn't like, for instance, you know, stay there for a long time, right? So, but it's you know you have to kind of grab it. At that moment, so so I'm wondering if um, you know what you're saying kind of fit maybe uh, another kind of moment or kind of be contextualized uh, within you know how Sudanese, for instance, uh, Sudanese men in particular, right, um, are uh, represented in in the Arab world or in Egypt, uh, because I know there is also a history of racialization. Um, uh, of Sudanese in Egypt and in Lebanon and other places um, that um, often, you know, kind of, um, conf you know, kind of conflate the gendering and, and, and the racing of Sudanese, you know, Sudanese are definitely um, seen as, you know, subordinate to the image of the Arab, um, uh, you know, the Arab person. Um, I, it has to do with history of uh, intervention and colonialism, right, from, from these places as well, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I'll look more into it. Yeah, I, I'm just- Masculinization, yeah. As I, as I think aloud about it, I wonder if some of it hinges on, on the moment of, um, of political independence that you talked about in the 1950s uh, as well, if, if, if there's a shift, especially, in Arabic, but anyway, for some food for thought, thank you very much. Um, I uh, I see in the Q and A here we have a, a question from uh, Sally Anna Pissera. Uh, says you referenced and in introducing the image of Alaa Saleh. Uh, the comparisons between her and the picture and the figure of the Nubian queen. Could you discuss more this uh, image of the Nubian queen? Yes. Yes. Ah. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I was trying to kind of think about it with reference, you know, to the kind of the moment of vulnerability that we were talking about um, earlier, you know, like the moment of separation that made Sudan look very vulnerable. And then with the revolution, and this kind of relate to what you were saying, Samuel, you know, that how this representation also shifts. So that moment allowed, you know, the moment of the revolution allowed for this, um, you know, this image to kind of circulate also easily and to represent Sudan as emerging like triumphantly from that regime of Omar al-Bashir that was represented as a threat to the global security. Uh, but uh, Allah herself, you know, um, you know, uh, when she was, um, you know, acting um, during that um, moment, she was wearing, you know, like the Sudanese um, taupe, which is white, which represent a, a, a generation of uh, Sudanese feminists who fought, you know, since the, um, you know, the independence of Sudan until uh, today, you know, they've been fighting for including women in the public sphere and, and everything. So, so she was wearing that, too, but she was also wearing, you know, these big earrings that are associated with, um, with the Nubian women in, in northern Sudan. So uh, to, to kind of respond to your, um, uh, your question uh, is to say that this image also inspired me and another uh, three colleagues of, uh, of mine to uh, write a proposal about uh, you know uh, the the um, you know the life of of heritage you know Nubia as a legacy and how people live it um, in in um, uh, how they live it today. So we got uh, you know this uh, this award and we're working um, uh, on it to kind of uh, you know just interview Sudanese about you know how Nubia was represented during the revolution. We I have a colleague who is actually an archaeologist who is doing work also. Um, in Nubian site um, 
uh, in northern Sudan, and then another colleague who's doing um, you know work in in Egypt with Nubian in in Egypt. So it kind of brought all of this kind of um, uh, excitement and energy, and people want to uh, reflect uh, on um, you know on Sudan and the revolution and this part uh, that emphasized Nubia. So apparently, you know, all these protesters are you know bringing this past to say you know we have a very kind of rooted identity in the world you know because as i said you know the question of identity has been a lingering question so what they are saying look you know we have this old civilization why don't we we draw from this um old legacy and kind of build a future that is better than um than what we had uh, or a better than you know uh, all the kind of the, uh, dictator um, um, or the, the regimes that are, um, you know, did not, sorry, I'm, I'm losing my track of thought here. <laughs> I'm getting, you know, this, yeah, hold on. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, so you have this kind of futuristic idea about, um, uh, about Sudan now, you know, that is grounded in this kind of uh, old history. And people are trying to, you know, come back to it and draw from it and you represent it uh, in a, in a um, you know, a, a future lens. But again, you know, it's, it's the image. The image of Allah herself does not represent the reality of Sudanese women right now, right? So it's an image, you know, Allah herself, you know, talks a lot about, you know, uh, the setback that happened after the, the revolution. Um, and nobody is, um, you know, taking care of the most important things that women have raised in the past and today. So uh, again, you know, what does the image tell us and what the reality tell us, I think is the most important thing. I apologize for um, losing my uh, my track of thought for a minute. So I had an issue here with. <laughs> yeah. Well, Zoom is especially challenging, I think, in that we're not all sitting in a room together. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. thank you uh, to to Saliana for for the question. Do we have other questions uh, here that that uh, that we can uh, relate to Professor Fadlalla? Yeah, maybe this way I can look, see you better. <laughs> I guess I would be curious about um, what it's like conducting the kind of field work uh, that you do, because it seems to me that in the last 20 or so years, we've we've seen a, a precipitous rise in public interest in, in Sudan, you know, when you think of Dave Edgar's coming out with his book um, and, and, and the formation of a, of a new recognized nation in, in, uh, in, in South Sudan. And you can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine that uh, in sort of, you know, mainstream American society, there might not be quite as much direct interest as there was, let's say 15 years ago uh, in, in, in issues, uh, related to, um, you know, to, to Sudanese life, you know, in, in, in Sudan, uh, and abroad. Um, is that, is that the case? Is that, is that not the case? Do you sort of, are you able to, to operate more or less independently of the kind of wiles of, 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 of public interest and the way that it, you know, goes through certain peaks and lulls? Yeah. I mean, uh, I think that, I mean, now Sudan is definitely, um, uh, in the public eye. And I think uh, maybe partly because of the revolution and also because of, you know, how the revolution was uh, co-opted, uh, you know, in 2021 uh, by the military, uh, but also because of the insistence of the protesters, you know, uh, and uh, their continuous, um, you know, sitting in the street that, you know, this revolution should not, you know, get stolen from them, right? So we see a more, you know, like a, a more kind of intervention from the international community to also push this, uh, you know, this democratic um, idea forward. So um, it's, it's a very, I don't know, it's a very fragile situation, really. 
Um, so, but um, yesterday I heard that, you know, the uh, different parties, uh, the military in, and, and the, you know, the parties that represent, um, you know, the revolutionaries uh, or some of them, because there are division within that as well. Uh, they are signing um, uh, another, uh, you know, um, agreement to uh, bring in a, a vice president and to bring in a civilian government. And so uh, it's a very, it's a, like a theater for me to kind of uh, look at right now what is going to happen. Because uh, from the perspective of the revolutionaries, um, that they want to learn from what happened in the Arab uh, spring, that they don't want this to kind of just waste, right? And they wanted to reach uh, some point, um, you know, uh, whatever it's, it is, you know, is it democracy? Is it civilian rule? How is this civilian rule going to look like? So, uh, but there is still fragmentation, right? Within the revolutionary um, groups themselves, within the um, you know, the military uh, groups, you know, uh, resisting, um, you know, the who started resisting Bashir and now they are also resisting any kind of, um, you know, um, government that doesn't include them. So I would say, yes, I think the, inter the international community <laughs> is very interested. So we'll see, we'll see with that, um, with that um, where that take, take us. Thank you. Um, I, I want to make sure we don't neglect uh, uh, Noma's question here, who uh, we can always count on for very, very uh, probing and, and, uh, and, and theoretically deep uh, questions here. I'll read it for those who can't um, read the Q&A. How does your idea about the feminization of vulnerability in Sudan uh, differ from Stella Nianzi's use of vulnerability, that is menstruation, to speak back to power in Uganda? Could the difference be a matter of geography? Also, please speak a bit about how you feminize vulnerability without essentializing women, women as custodians of culture. Ah, uh, hmm, interesting question. So yeah, I mean, vulnerability has to do with definitely with, um, you know, bod bodily fluid and how women, uh, women's body has always been seen as vulnerable in that way, right? Uh, but um, um, feminists have um, tried uh, many times to kind of situate, you know, this, uh, this understanding of the female body in, you know, the kind of uh, political history that also shape uh, people's uh, ideas about, you know, how the how they view women uh, in different settings. Uh, it doesn't have to essentialize women, but it's about the representation of the women themselves um, uh, in different places in the world. How the body itself uh, often kind of represent the nation, uh, and the nation itself sometimes can be strong, but uh, sometimes can be. Uh, seen as weak, depending on where it is in the global political map, right? So, um, so I I think when I talk about the feminization of vulnerability, I want to point to how you know, especially like in Eastern Sudan, for instance, how women interpreted their vulnerability uh, with reference to their location in Sudan as a nation and the kind of, uh, the kind of marginalization that um, they have been experiencing for a long time. Not that they think they are vulnerable. On the uh, you know, opposite to that, actually, women are the center of the community. And I saw, uh, I showed that, um, uh, that uh, slide uh, about the centrality of the woman. Uh, in, in the Hadandawa um, community. So the tent is actually constructed by the women themselves. And women own, own the tent. Uh, and um, they see it as the, the center of, uh, of, of the community, the center of well-being, the center of health. But whatever comes from outside that they don't know about, 
they attribute it to, you know, uh, situations of uh, illness, situations of miscarriage, situa situation of, uh, of, of other vulnerabilities. Because, um, you know, uh, in their area, they have experienced so many uh, droughts and so many famines. And who was helping them? Is the NGOs. So the NGOs uh, come to their land and they, you know, they distribute all this kind of food, you know, milk, um, you know, other grains, all the food that they are not familiar with. So they attribute some of these, um, you know, some of this mishap to the stuff that the commodities uh, and the food that they, um, they take that they are not familiar with. But this is also not a binary thing because there are moments, you know, uh, when they invoke halafa, they invoke this reversal logic in, you know, healing circles. So they bring these commodities, they distribute them, they take what is actually very familiar, they leave what is not familiar. And it, it, by doing that, they negotiate, uh, you know, um, with these external forces they bring them close to them and they negotiate with them. And then, of course, you know, they adopt some of these practices and they leave what is not familiar, right? So it's again, this process of sifting through and um, looking at these, um, at these uh, you know, influences with their keen eye. Um, thank you. There, there is a looks like a follow up question from Sally Anna, but um, I want to respect the the time limits that generally um, we impose on Africa at noon to go right to the hour. Let um, folks get to whatever their uh, next engagement uh, might be. But if you want to do follow up uh, directly, we've got it recorded here uh, in our Q and A. Uh, thank you all uh, for attending. Uh, thanks especially, especially uh, to our uh, speaker here, Professor uh, Fadlola. Uh, it's very kind of you to, to, uh, to join us here and, and to have uh, prepared and delivered uh, this talk on uh, what we've seen as a, an issue with enormous uh, currency. Um, thank you all on behalf of ACS uh, and on behalf of ASP, the African Studies uh, program. Uh, I'd like to thank you for joining for a, a, another talk in Africa at noon and the Embodied Africa uh, series. Have a lovely uh, rest of, of, of your afternoon. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Well, Salamili ala